I'm so happy and honored to be here. Um, my mother and father, mom right here, are members of this church, and it's just a blessing to be able to come to this home. Um, they found a new home, and I know that you guys welcome them with open arms, so I just want to say thank you guys and honor you guys for that. Um, and Krista, it's an honor Thanks. to sit here. Thank, thank you for you, asking Natalie. me. Thank you for trusting me with this conversation. You are extraordinary. Um, and I just want you guys to know the purpose of this conversation is to really illuminate what God does with our pain and how he turns it into purpose. Amen. What he does with our trauma and how he turns it into triumph. Amen. Thank and you. And what he does with our isolation and how he turns it into empowerment. Yes. So that is what we are about to get into. You ready, girl? You preaching already. You ready? Now. I'm about are just, you ready? Just say amen. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. You are a wife, a mother, and a, a mother of four, <clears throat> a pastor here at Midtown, and an author. What was the impetus and why behind sharing your story? Oh, wow. I, I just think what you, um, a little bit of what Bob alluded to and what you uh, alluded to, um, from the moment that I would say God found me, um, I just wanted to share that, right? I felt so much love and so much freedom and so much hope and, and so much um, just of the goodness of God that I didn't know before growing up. Some of you may have grown up in church, and so you may have grown up knowing, or maybe your parents told you you were loved, you were special, but I didn't grow up in church. And so the first time I was invited to church for real, for real, and walked in those doors, a little church right down the street, uh, the name of the church is Bethel, and um, my husband and I were college students, and I was a mess. I'll just say my life was a mess, and so when I heard that message, and when that message resonated and took over my life, I just have always wanted to share that. I want other people to experience the goodness of God, like you said, the freedom of God, to know that God loves them. So, And so um, if some of you haven't read the book, right in the first chapter, we get right into it. We learn. Right into we it. We get right into it. <laughs> We learn the reality of your childhood. We learn the reality of your relationship with your father. Yeah. And um, I'm going to get right into it. Uh, there, was a, there was a line that you wrote that it was so piercing for me because obviously it wasn't something that I've experienced, but I would love for you to expound on it a bit. You said, my father was not only a priest, he was a man who denied being my father even after all these years. Can you share with us two things here? Can you share with us the backstory on how you were conceived and mm. how that made you feel? Well, the story of the conception is that my mom was my, first of all, let me just say my mom's sisters are right here on the front row. My mom's sister, um, my aunt who helped raise me, my cousin Nikki, she'll get mad at me if I don't say. She said, and your cousin. I would keep saying my aunts are here, my aunts are here. She said, and your cousin. But um, so my mom's family, they, they grew up in San Fernando Valley, and my mom was really bright. My, my aunts kind of say, girl, we wasn't smart as your mama. So my mom was the only one who had this privilege of going to a Catholic, an all-Catholic girls' school. And so um, she met my father when she was around 14 years of age, and he mentored her, and he, and he um, put her up for awards. He was her therapist, so not only was he her her mentor, but he was also her therapist and he was a Catholic priest. And so at some point, um, the relationship in his mind turned inappropriate and he took an inappropriate interest in my mom. And so out of that, he, he approached her and out of that, they consummated a, a, I won't call it, I hate, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> I don't know. Today we call it grooming. <laughs> But they didn't have a word for grooming back then, I don't think. I don't think they had a word for grooming. And so my mom loved him. My, my father's, it's okay to say his name because he's, he's passed away. His name is John Christensen, and he was called Father Chris. So my mom named me after him. She thought they would get married. She thought that he would leave the priesthood and that he would love her. And so when she found out she was pregnant, she went to him and, you know, Chris, we can raise this baby together. And so... Um, he said, I, absolutely not. We will not be raising this baby together. What we're going to do is give this baby up for adoption. Mm -hmm. So my mom went into a home. This is very common in the 60s, in the late 60s. Um, 
my mom went to a home for unwed mothers. And what you would do is you'd get pregnant as a teen and um, they would ship you off and it'd be like, oh, you know, Diane just went over to uh, Texas for summer vacation and she'll be back. And so she was supposed to go to this home for unwed mothers, give me up for an adoption and never look back and never look back. But the problem was, or the issue was, that she knew not only was my father a Catholic priest, but my father's white and my mother's black, and this is 1967. And so when she started, she confided in, I think, a counselor, and she said, you know, I'm giving my baby up because I want her to be loved, and I wanted to go to a great family and have a home, but she also said the daddy's white. And they are like, girl. <laughs> This baby may end up in an orphanage the rest of her life because back then it's not like Angelina Jolie and, and all these people who adopt, you know, biracial kids and different kids. You adopted people and that, that's looked, real. that could pass for you, right? And it could be yours. Yeah. Even you hear about this in black families. I don't know about other families, but I know friends who grew up thinking their aunties were their mothers. Grew up thinking their aunties were their mothers because this is what you did. So... Um, went into that home and when I guess when the counselor kind of made her cognizant of that, she decided she was gonna defy the Catholic Church, she was gonna defy my dad and she said, I'm keeping my baby. You may not wanna be this baby daddy, right, right. But, I'm, but I'm gonna keep my baby. And so um, that just set off a whole nother series of challenges and issues and um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> But you just answered it how, yeah. how you felt but with that we oh, could, the, the line yeah. about so there are a lot of labels that I wore and I'm going to get into some of those tomorrow when I'm actually sharing it going a little bit more in depth there are a lot of labels that I wore but I think of the worst label is to be unwanted mm. like to be illegitimate to be unwanted by your father mm. it just it just scarred me it was like a scar that I just carry throughout life to just to carry that unwanted. And so the other things hurt, the other words hurt, the other things hurt, but I think that sting, that pain is the pain that drove some of the, the decisions that I would make throughout my life, bad decisions and poor decisions and how I felt about myself. Well, that leads me into my next question. I think as we learn early on, you know, throughout your childhood, you were introduced to shame. You were introduced to rejection, yep. dysfunction, trauma yep. at a very early age. And so therefore, from a product of that, you picked up all of these labels. Mm -hmm. I'm a mistake. I'm not good enough. Yep. I'm unwanted. Yep. And as we know, shame and rejection is one of the biggest things that the enemy wants to use yep. to rock us from our identity. Yep. And we have to be reminded that he can't, the enemy can't change who we are. Right. His biggest tactic is really just to make us doubt who we are. We are. Right. And right. so I think what I would love to know from you is looking back on that little girl now, mm. what labels would you give her now? And oh. what, how would you exchange those labels? I, I'm going to be completely honest and vulnerable because that's just who I am. We love it. And I would like to say I am 100% healed and I don't struggle anymore. I would like to say that. But the folks in this room who really know me know that that wouldn't be quite the truth. So I'm just going to be honest and say it's still a struggle. It's very hard for me to uh, walk in, walk outside of those labels. But I had this really awesome experience with my kids this past week. Um, I really, It was really important to me with my husband and with my kids before I did this, just to say, hey, we have a great family, I love you, but I wanna just go a step deeper before we start going out sharing to f that we would know that we're tight, we're good. So I, it was hard as heck, finagling all these kids' schedules and kids on different time zones and babies crying in the background and all this crazy, I just noticed this, oh my gosh. I'm anyway, I'm blown away, I'm looking at some friends who are here, so they finally got on the phone and I didn't want to cry, but I bawled the whole time. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just, I said, you know, I grew up with trauma and the most important thing and I probably didn't do a good job. And I, I apologize if I didn't do all the things right. And, but I told them, I said, the most important thing, I don't care how far and wide I go. And I say this and I say this often and it's true. If someone were come to me and say, 
You, you can choose to be successful and rich and everybody will know your name and you'll want for nothing or you can choose to be normal and average and have this amazing family that loves each other. Not perfect, you guys, but loves each other. I told them, I, they, they know I say this all the time. I wouldn't trade that. I would, y'all can have the riches and you can have the fame and you can have the success and you can have it all. I'll take these people sitting right over here and wherever my husband is and all my grandbaby and my Levo, look at Lev. He's, <laughs> I'll take them. And so anyway, at the end of the conversation, I'm just crying, right? And so I said, this is not a conversation for you to tell me I did great. Was, that really wasn't the point. But I did have a request. I said, I want all of you all to pray for me before I get off this call. So they said, all of us? Like, right now, pray for you? And I was like, I think Eric, I don't want to rat him out. I think Eric was the one who said, you meant right now, Mom? We thought you meant, like, in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> so Lexi, being the big sister that she is, she said, well, Mom, one of us can pray, and I'll do it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I done prayed over y'all and spoken over y'all. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at some good friends back here when they were babies, Stacy and Darius, and they know from the moment I would know they're pregnant. So anyway, they started praying over me, and then they started rebuking me. I think they were telling me, Mom, it's time for you to walk in your confidence, and hey. it's time for you to be bold. Hey. And be, I was like, I was like hey. what? Hey, then I one of them, Mondo said, and, and in Jesus' name, I rebuke the spirit of death and suicide, Ooh. and I rebuke low self-esteem, and I don't know. <laughs> and then Lex was like, yeah, mom, we're not having any more of these conversations where you're calling us apologizing. We're not having this conversation anymore. There are no more apologies. You do not, you no longer have to apologize for who you are. Come on. Come she on. said, apologize for making a mistake. But don't apologize for who you are. And then, and then my son Aaron, my oldest son Aaron said, Mom, you, well, what do you, it's just time. It's just your time. You, you've served and you give and you deserve. I said, no, I don't deserve. I don't deserve the goodness of God, but I sure will take it. Come on. That's so That's I think good. the real honest answer is I feel like I'm in a season where God is still pulling off those things, yeah. Bob, as I'm looking at Bongo Bob. He's still pulling off, and that's okay. You know what? Yeah. We all have a story in this room, yeah. and I don't think you can put a bow on it. One of the things I was nervous about about writing the book is I really wrote it to say, God is so good, and he's been so good to me, right? Yeah. But I'm realizing as I'm writing the stories, I don't want people to think like, oh, well, see, she just, you know, she went to God, and then she came to God, and then all, all her problems were over, and then she never had a problem again. Um, Gus and I have been married 36 years. We still fight. <laughs> it's because I'm right and he's wrong. <laughs> um, my kids know we're, ha we're having this conversation. I was having this conversation with my oldest son. He's like, Mom, people look at our family like they're perfect. I said, perfect? I, I have never done anything for God for you all to think I'm perfect. Mm -hmm. I said to them and I said to him, I've come to God and I come to God and I keep coming to God because I'm such a mess. I don't know how to live life without God. So yeah. if you see me praising yeah. and you see me testifying and you see me write a book or you see me doing any of that, it's not because I think I'm perfect. It's because I know that I know that I know who I need and that I'm, I'm, I'm no good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I'm no good without him. That's so. good. So y'all don't think just because I wrote a book, y'all don't y'all come up to me and say, they don't think like, oh, you must think you got it all together or no longer I'm going to be talking like, oh, I'm, I'm scared. They keep telling me to stop saying I'm scared to preach. I'm sorry. But when I have real. to preach, I get scared. But that's okay. I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to do it afraid. And hopefully, maybe God will give me some type of confidence, but maybe he won't. He's maybe gonna he gonna just, it. right. Maybe he's just gonna leave me just the way I am, so that I can remain in his presence. Let's just say that and humble. And so, even throughout the book, um, you shared a very intimate, scary, dark moment. Mm. Um, your life has been a persistent, perpetual state of trauma, pain, poverty, all of those things. And out of product of that, you had a moment where you wanted to take your life. Yeah. 
where you wanted to commit suicide. Yep. And there's something I want to, there's a quote here that I want to read that I feel like is an emotion that when people are in your position mm. have potentially experienced. In that moment, I knew I didn't want to die. I just didn't know how to live. What did you mean by that and how do you live today? So um, <clears throat> by the time I was like in seventh grade, so all those things that you think about unwanted, unloved, I was a mistake. I just kept thinking I ruined my mother's life. She was bright and had a bright future. Um, she probably would have gone on to go to law school or do something amazing had she not, you know, had to have a baby. And so by the time I got to middle school, I just thought about suicide a lot. For several years, I contemplated it. And, and so um, I remember seeing on TV that if you take aspirin, you might not die. And then you wake up in your hospital and everybody thinks you're crazy. So I said, I'm going, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to for real do it. And so I started my aunt's here today. I started stealing my cousin's seizure medicine. And I would just take a little bit at a time and I stored it up. And then I don't know what happened. It was, it was a Christmas break and I don't know. It was just a, it just became a really dark, hopeless time for me. And I just kept thinking I don't have a future and that I would never be loved. And so this night, and I had, when I dreamed about it or when I thought about it, I said, I'm gonna write a letter and I'm gonna do all these things. It was so dark, I didn't even write a letter. Mm. I just took, I went in the kitchen and I got a bunch of those pills and I swallowed them down and I went and laid on the couch and I said, you know, me no more. Mm. This will be it. And they'll just find my body mm. when they find my body. So. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 So as God does, you know, I'm preaching on this tomorrow, but he numbers our days. He said every day, come on, every day ordained for you is written yeah. in my books. Yeah. And so he was looking down and he let a friend call that night. And I heard this voice in my head say, what are you going to do? You took those pills. And it was like, it was, it had to be less than a minute. Yeah. So I just remember I had a dilemma and I said, you know, I told the friend I'd call him back and I went and tried to get, you know, get rid of the pills as much as I could and then I got scared because I'm thinking like oh I don't know I don't I don't I don't want to die but I just don't know how to live and so um I don't think I ever no I didn't I know I didn't I never tried suicide again but it'd be a few years before I would really just break free from that suicidal thought and just I didn't break free from the thought that I didn't know how that I would be loved if how I'd ever be loved, but just it just scared me to think, ooh, that was kind of permanent, right? And I never told anyone. I didn't start talking about this till I was an adult, because again, I growing up with a mother who had mental illness, um, from a kid I knew my mom had mental illness. I just didn't want that label too. I said, now I got enough labels. And back then, you know, the world wasn't kind. So we called mental illness. We didn't, we didn't, I don't know about you, but they would say, you know, the special one in your family. You know that one, right? Or they would say, they just crazy. And I said, Lord, I got enough problems. I'm biracial. I'm too tall. I got redhead nobody likes. I got freckles. Um, I'm unwanted. I'm not going to be crazy, too, on top of that. So I just never told anyone. I was sick for weeks. I was sick for weeks. But I just said, nope, can't tell anyone that one. So I will tuck that away. So that's what I meant by uh, I don't know how I'm going to live. And how are you able to live today? Well, as those of you who know me again, I would say I'm, o I'm, only, I'm alive by the grace of God. I mean, the grace of God was always there. Um, he just, he rescued me. Yeah. He was there all along, but he just rescued me. And then it took years. It's taken some years. But he just began to, I say my, my life is like an onion to me. He just began to pull off a layer at a time. Because if he just ripped it all off, you know, I don't know if we could, we would make it. But until he just, until today, he just keeps giving me strength to live. He just, you know, I, I'm so thankful for Bethel. Um, my, my pastor's daughter, Stacy, is sitting over there with her husband, Darius. And when I got saved at her parents' church, they were the only young people there. They were little teenagers. 
but they were little teenagers who loved the Lord, and um, they just took me in as their family, and I just began to learn what a healthy family could look like. Uh, I began to learn uh, God was real, though, because Stacy was a mess. <laughs> we would have great times, and, and I just learned. I just began to learn that you know God's word was important, too, yeah. because um, the verse... I say, I say it's the life verse of this book. I signed the books and I signed, I signed this Psalms 139 where he says, yeah. when I, I saw you, when you were being made in secret, yes. I'm like, is this for me? I know it wasn't, you know, but I just took that as for me. He said, I saw you when you were being shaped and you were being formed in secret. And he said, when I think of you, I think, uh, I say that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, if I could count the sand, yeah. that's a word. then I could count how precious the thoughts, my thoughts are towards yeah. you. So if you're here back tomorrow, you guys have to hear some of this again, okay? Yeah. I'll go a little deeper. But when I read that, first of all, I argued with it. Mm. I said, there ain't nothing fearful or wonderful about me. Mm. I'm too tall. I just had all these negative things. I won't go on to I just had all these, I'm too. I'm too this, I'm too that. But it, it just took a while. It just took a while. It's still taking a while yeah. to say no. I'm finally at 55 years old, finally okay with being biracial, mm -hmm. finally okay with being this tall, uh, to be complete 100. Honest, I hated having red hair. I said I would dye my hair black when I got older. Now I'm at the beauty shop going, girl, look at the picture. <laughs> Seriously, this is for real. I don't know if Stephanie's in here does my hair. I'm like, this is my real hair. It used to be this red. You think you can get it back like that? That's good. That's so I'm good. embracing my yes. red hair. Yes. I'm embracing my freckles. Yes. yes. I'm embracing my biracialness. Yes. yes. All the things. I'm embracing my height. Yes. <laughs> we need it. I'm embracing everything. I'm 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 gonna walk in embracing who I am. As so you I, should. I finally am embracing that. So as you should. Okay, so. switching gears a bit. You met Gus at Sac State. Yeah, where Gus. my boo at? Where you at, babe? I can't see. <laughs> where you. is he? Where he go? Where oh, there are he you? is. <laughs> there he is. Oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. We should let him, I'm, I'm joking, but we should let him come up and tell his version of this Facts. story line. We should, potentially. Storyline. Story line. Maybe then. not. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> right. Because he tells it quite differently than I tell it. Than how you guys met. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what I thought was so fascinating and encouraging about your guys' relationship was despite the pain and the trauma that you went through, you were still able to receive and give love. Yeah. And I think a lot of times when we have pain in our life, when we have shame and rejection, we build these walls so that we don't want to get hurt again and our heart becomes hardened. So if you can tell me pragmatically, how are you able to receive and give love despite the trauma and pain in your life? Well, I think, first of all, I just want to uh, give a, a shout out to my husband, my husband, Gus, back there. Um, I would say that Gus was an example of what unconditional love looked like. Mm. And so I don't think I ever met a man, a young man, too. He was 24 when we met. That just loves me for me. I've never heard him say, you're too chubby. You put on weight. I don't like your hair. I, don't, I mean, from the moment we met, He's always been just, you're beautiful. I love you. He, he, he says he did. You know, he says I chased him down, but. No, she did not. I'll let him believe no, that. She did not. I'll let him believe that. But later he told me, like, when I went to his, his apartment for the first time, his roommates was like, oh, that's her. I'm like, what's that mean? What's that mean? He said, oh, you're the one my boy been talking about. So he said that I could see your flaming red hair from across the campus. And he said, you know, it was like, I'd put myself in the library hoping you noticed. And Letty, wave your hand, Letty. <laughs> this is a longer story, but Letty, our, our, uh, Bob's wife, Letty, who we all pastor and in ministry together, we actually met at Sac State before we were saved. And so she would teach, say, here comes Gus. And I'm like, girl, <laughs> bye. Ain't nobody think about Gus. But brothers pick game, and uh, here we are. You've got to read the rest in the book. Here we are. But he loved me unconditionally. Yeah. So okay. that was the beginning. Having a, a husband yeah. who supports you and believes in you and 
re- keeps reminding you. I'm sure he got ad nauseum. I'm sure he's like, what's wrong with you? And even my friends today, like friends in this room, right? Pastor Bob and Letty and all these people, my kids, they're always encouraging me yeah, right. and saying, mom, you are, you, you're already that. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I want to be more, you're already that. Yeah. And so God strategically gave me a family mm-hmm. and friends yeah. and people in my life that continue to pour into me. And when I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, they're like, girl, you got it. Your girl, you got it. So, I mean, obviously, I just want to say thank you to everybody in this room who came today. This is just an example of people who said we love you and we want to be here to yeah. support you. And so that community of faith, yeah. the same community where my mother got broken and that caused trauma, I'd say, is the same how God does a 360. Come on. That's good. That's really, really good. And God says, like you said, what Satan meant for evil, I will turn for good. Yes. There you go. And how God redeems and transforms yes. and says it's going to start yes. one way and it's going to look yes. a certain way, but I'm going to turn it around. Yes, yes. And yes. so that same community is where I have found hope yeah. and where my identity has been reshaped. Oh, that's good. All right. Well, actually, still speaking of you and Gus, um, and I Gus. think candidly speaking, I think even if even when we know who we are, even yeah. for me, I know who I am, but I still have moments of of doubt and trigger comes you get a trigger and memory recall and that's probably the biggest thing that the enemy loves to use is is your triggers and your memory recall and in the book there was a moment where i saw that you literally it was a trigger and you you answered you responded to gus through a place of rejection and i want to read it it's pretty (laughs) funny but not so gus texts you Gus texted you after the during a game and said we have to talk yes and so he says so Gus says, we need to talk after the game, after the basketball game. And in your head, you say, I should have known our relationship was too good to be true. He paused and I braced myself for the bad news, mm-hmm. that he was interested in seeing other people or that he wanted to break up altogether. Mm. I was already preparing my comeback in my head. Yes. And the reality was, <laughs> before I get to the other part, the reality was the coach just wanted her to be quiet be at quiet. the bench. <laughs> Y'all, she was too loud. That's all that, that he wanted. said, Letty By and Krista, the way, tell your girlfriend, stop sitting behind the be bench. Be quiet, using basically. Her, screen, using her voice as a whistle and yes. a horn and shut up, basically. Be, I was like, oh, that Be was quiet. It. That was but it. with that, I think it's imperative and illum- it's important for us to illuminate that we still have those triggers. We yes. still have those moments. So what are the tools that you use when you do get triggered and when the memory recall comes up and you go from one to 10 in all reality, yep. you don't need to go to yep. one to 10. Yep. So how do you reel back? Yep. Well, one thing is counseling. Hey. I, I, you know, like me and my counselor, we do this. We have this tune up relationship. So when I, when I said I was going to start writing this book, I did feel like I still was feeling like Little things can happen in my life, and they still say unloved. Mm. So every now and again, something will happen, and I'll interpret it as, they don't love me. See, Mm. they don't love you. Mm. Um, And so I still have to battle that voice. But so I went to my therapist. I was just honest. I'm like, I still struggle with this. Yeah. And so we just continue to work through it. And so it's like, um, I, I don't know, things like with anything else, like, exercise and eating right you know what you're supposed to do right yeah but then do we don't always do it so you just sit you fall down sometimes and you get back up so I really say I fall down and I get back up but it's just that and then I honestly I just have to say God's word because when I forget who I am like when I was getting ready to go back to the counseling I had this thing um I realized too that okay so a lot of my life I was bullied Mm -hmm. and I've had to figure out, I was constantly always trying to figure out how to fit myself in the frame of someone else's existence. Like mm. they're not, you're not black. Mm. You know, um, it was, it was rough growing mm. up in the jungle. Mm. Kids didn't look like me. There weren't biracial kids. Now everybody's biracial, but it wasn't biracial was not cool back in the day. And I, it, it, just people were, inti- you know, we have a lot of colorism in our community. Right. I don't, for those of you who don't know what that is, is, Black people have been undervalued and pushed down for being who they are for so many years, right? So within, and it it goes back to slavery. So you had the biracial, the slave master's kids would be in the house and they would have the good hair and they got to eat the slightly better meal. And then the true 
Africans or the brown skinned people were made to work out in the fields. And so these, this type of language still and this type of feeling still exists um, in, our, in our communities today, um, just, just issues with colorism. So right. I realize now that the girls who said we hate you, you know, girls would try to jump me. I mean, this was, I, it was it was scary times growing up in L.A. And they would. I remember one time I was coming home from school, and this group of girls surrounded me, and they were like, "Be, you know, y'all the superlatives. We gonna cut your face. You think you cute? You ain't better than us, and you ain't that cute." And I'm like, I don't think I'm cute. I want to look like y'all. I did like, and so. Just that fitting, you know, the things that happen in our communities, fitting into that, that frame of existence. I realize, too, now as an adult, those are just broken people, too. Yeah. Because yeah. they've been told that they're not good. Yes. They've been told that their skin's not beautiful, and yeah. they've been told that their hair is not good, and they've been told that they're not good enough for who they are. So they project, we project that on each other. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. And so... The, in the latter end of the book, you talk about your healing journey and one of the prerequisites, as we all know, in healing is forgiveness. And yes. that's very difficult to do, especially with, you know, yeah. the life that you've lived. Yeah. However, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mandate. We must do it. Yep. And I want to read this excerpt that you felt le that was led by the Holy Spirit. He said, Krista, if you hold on to the unforgiveness and bitterness that you have against your parents, mm -hmm. you will stay stuck in the pain. You won't be fully able to move forward into the future that I have planned for you. Mm. You've been praying to be free from your past. Mm. It is the next step toward that freedom. Mm. Forgiveness isn't easy, but I'm right here with you. Mm. What does that mean to you? Uh, it just takes me back, you know, um, because of all the pain. So father never was in the picture. So there was unforgiveness against him. But because my mom had a lot of mental illness, there were just times that, you know, she just wasn't able to be there or she wasn't emotionally present or maybe she was emotionally unhealthy. So I just carried such anger. It was just like this deep seated anger. And so when I got, when I became a Christian, I remember being in Bible study with Stacy's grandma. And I remember, you know, them teaching about forgiveness. The first time I heard the scripture that said, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And then I began to think about, again, this is all like, you, you know, you're learning and you're growing. I don't think any parent sets out to hurt their kids. I don't think there's bad people. I think there's bad things that happen to people. And they, you know, but I don't think my mother never set out to hurt me. She was just hurt herself, right? Mm -hmm. So she wasn't able to love me like I wanted to be loved. But that just led to such anger. And so I remember God showing me that picture of that verse. And then now I'm a new mom. And I don't know how many kids I have, but I'm thinking, if I don't forgive, if I don't get free from this, mm. then I'm going to make mistakes too, right. and I'm not going to be forget. You know, you, so it's like I could see these cycles that could be perpetuated. And so it took a while, but I just at first I was like, uh, no, because they have not apologized. Right. You know, so we think like if someone hasn't apologized, and then I thought they weren't worthy of my forgiveness, but honestly. None of us are worthy of God's forgiveness. Yeah. And he forgives us for all of our mess. And he continues to do that over and over again. So when you see yourself in that, from that perspective, you're like, whoa, I forgive, Lord. I forgive, Lord. Jesus, I, I forgive. And so I think it was that perspective that. And then, too, you just, I know people in this room, you meet people that have held on to stuff. Like they're 60 or 70, and they're still talking about something that happened to them when they were a kid, right? Mm -hmm. We all have dysfunctional, well, some of y'all don't, but have dysfunction in your family. We and, all do. Right, and you get into a family, you go to a family gathering, they still, t yeah, you remember the time. You, and you're like, you're 65 years old. You're still talking about You're still about talking that? about that incident? A lot. So I just think, you know, it's just human, but I think if we can, again, if we can begin to see that we are all going to mess up and that, and I, my kids can attest to this, I believe. I also knew it was important for me to ask for their forgiveness. Mm. And so I, even when they were little, if I lost my temper, I tried, you know, because I wanted them to understand that that was the relationship with God that they had to have too. Yeah. So if they didn't think 
that if they didn't see that you could still mess up and then you can go to God and ask for forgiveness, then as adults, they wouldn't, they would think when they messed up that they were too far away from God. So it all worked together to me in my relationship with the family, yeah. but then also in your walk with God, yeah. that you, it's a forgive and forget. You know, it's, it's, it's a constant process of Lord, forgive me, Lord, yeah. forgive me, Lord, yeah. and, and help me to forgive them, Lord, yeah. because that ain't the last hurt. You know, that hurt from childhood, I've had other hurts. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to say, Lord, I got to let that go. Yep. Because if I hold on to that, that's going to mess me up. That's the word. And so I, 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 I was messed up long enough, so yeah. I can't hold on to stuff. Yeah. So and it I, takes humility to forget. Right. Except for with yeah. Gus sometimes. Right. I get that. I might hold on to it. I said, Lord, I always apologize. This time, I'm going to wait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to wait. And that might call up Lexi. You know what your dad did? And I'm waiting. <laughs> so. All right. Lastly, <laughs> what legacy do you hope to leave? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Um, I think it has to do with my family again. It's really important for me to break generational cycles. You know, um, growing up in L.A., it's, it's hard, you guys. We judge society and we go, oh, look at those gang members and look at those poor people and look how they're doing, right? But we don't know their pain. We don't know how they got there. And so I have a lot of family members that succumb to the, the bully of poverty. I'm working on something. The other day I was like, I think poverty is a bully. Mm. It intimidates. Mm. You know, it, it seeks to destroy. It, mm. seeks, it seeks to do you harm. I said, mm. you know what? The real bully is poverty mm. because then poverty, you know, causes all kinds of things to happen in your life. So I said, I, n I never want my sons to have to choose between safety and being in a gang. It's real, you guys. I write about some of this stuff in my book. When you grow up in a certain neighborhood, it's not like you want to be, uh, you want to be a gang member or you want to live a certain life, but you don't have a choice. Yeah. You, don't you don't have a choice. Literally, they say, Either you're going to be in this gang or you're going to stay in your house. Which one is it? Either you're going to be, in, and sometimes you're, 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 you're not trying to do any of it. You're trying to escape it. But it's just all around you, right? We know so many people, right? We know uh, some of my, my, my sons uh, played, Armand played football at USC, and he played with a young man named Jarrell Casey. And Jarrell Casey grew up in Long Beach, and he had a mother who worked heck of hard. She couldn't hardly come to the games because we'd be all up at the games, me and Gus. We'd be like, we ain't working today. We're going to be at the game. But his mom was a single mom, and she couldn't afford to always take off work and be at her son's game. And Jarrell grew up in such a rough neighborhood that his brother, I believe, is still at Folsom in prison for life. Mm. And then Jarrell just happens to somehow get protected and not go into gangs and then Go, go on to play in the NFL and, you know, escape that. But it's real. And I wish you could say, oh, that's just Jarrell. Oh, that's just Krista. You guys, this is happening in cities across America. Yeah. Cities across America. We were talking about this. I, I, I don't know who said it. I think Martin Luther King might have said it. But, you know, you hear people say, um, they should just pull themselves up by the bootstraps. We didn't get no boots, some of us, y'all. That's easy to That's say good. when you got boots on. Yeah. Maybe you got 10 pair of boots in your closet that your family gave you, that your grandfather gave you, that your what, you know, that you you didn't you didn't earn that. Yeah. You didn't earn that. So I felt like I didn't have boots growing up. Yeah. <laughs> and I know a lot of us didn't have boots growing up. And so um, I didn't want my boys to be in gangs. I wanted my kids to have a mom who loved them and told them that they were valued, told them that they were special. Uh, I remember Gus and I were broke, but that didn't stop us from traveling and spending money, flying places. To, that didn't stop me from my oldest son, Aaron, was interested in music. So I said, we, we got to buy him a keyboard. We were broke. I don't know how I put, I put it on layaway or something. I'm going to figure it out. That didn't stop me from taking my daughter, who has a beautiful voice, by the way. A little girl would sing in church, and I would, with my broke self, took her over here to Arden Hill somewhere. <laughs> she was the only little beautiful chocolate drop that was in Mrs. Bloomer's Bloomer's play. Y'all remember? And I made the brothers come. I said, if Lexi has to go watch y'all play football and basketball and do all these things, then you all have to come to her plays. 
Now they teased her afterwards. Mrs. Bloomers, Bloomers, they'd be in the car singing, but... Um, <laughs> So really, I want, I want to leave a legacy of a family that loves each other. That's, mm. that's the real legacy. Yeah. That legacy, and honestly, you all, someone was asking me the other day. They were teasing me, really. They were like, when you blow up and when you do all these things, you know, when you go on Oprah, when you go, okay, whatever. But, um, you know, like, what are you going to do? And why did you write this book? And I said, it might not be the politically correct answer, but. I really have written this book to say God is so good. Yeah, yeah. And if you feel, I'm, I'm sure everybody in this room has felt one of these things. You know, you've been, you've been, um, you've been criticized by society, or you've been rejected by a parent, or you've been, you've been divorced, or you've been these things. Right? I don't care if you're rich, you've experienced these things. And I just really want this book to fall into the hands of people. And I've literally lifted it up to God as a gift and just said, Lord. If you can just take one story out of my life and it can bless somebody, just let this multiply like a little seed and let it give hope and encouragement. So I want to leave a legacy of having a great family, which I do. And I just want to be, have a legacy of that. I loved God yeah. and I love people. Yeah. And I spent the rest of my life just saying, God loves you. Yeah. God loves you. What can I do to encourage you? So, so good. And yeah. As we close, because I've way over time, but as we close, my bad. Um, you know, this is just indicative of nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted, that God uses everything for his good. And I know that you are obviously here in ministry working, so you're giving back with the experiences that you've had, with the lessons and tools that you've learned. You're able, you know, to me, I say always that the greatest way to serve is to tell your story. Wow. And you have told your story. You have given us a blueprint of how we can use, you know, these tools that help us with shame and rejection. And again, like I said, you do that here at the church. And you also have, I would love for you to kind of expound on a little bit of the yeah. foundation that you have with your son. So my son and his wife, Mindy, Dr. Mindy Armstead, Eric, you can give a wave over there. You know, over there. They started a foundation, Armstead Academic Project. And so um, I think our family has always sought to give back. I um, raised all my kids, I think, uh, to know the Lord, but also to, I feel like I was transparent about other people's lives and um, the Bethel, church where I got saved right down the street. It was steeped in all of this. Um, it was it was very rough. Oak Park was a very rough neighborhood riddled with gangs and drugs. And so we went to church there for 20 years. We served in the community. We took youth groups, right, Darius and Stacy. We, we, we gathered kids from the community. And we, one time we took them to see the Bible man at Arden, at uh, Arco Arena. So it's just been the heart of our family to give back. And so I'm, I'm very proud of the work that my son does with Armstead Academic Project. And then the other thing is at the end of this book, I do mention my church, Midtown Church, you all. Let me give it up for my church. Yes, she does. Uh, and I would say there is no perfect church, y'all. So don't come here if you're thinking you're going to find a perfect church. Just please stay where you're at because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be imperfect. But one thing I will have to say, this started with the late, great Sherwood Carthen, Carthen and Boss Church. And we and, and Sherwood was a community person. And then it continued as we went to what was known as the House Church. And then what is known as Midtown today. You look around, our church looks like this on Sunday. And God brings people from everywhere to give back. We say this is a church without walls. And then Elk Grove Church, Pastor Ty said, this is not church as usual. I really love being here at Midtown and serving here at Midtown because we've done work in the community the whole time, you all, that we've been here. We started um, ministries down at Leotata Floyd and in Marina Vista, out of Grove, this public housing where Bongo Bob, wave your hand, Bongo Bob. Bongo Bob actually grew up in, in those communities and we've made it in a value and we've made it important. And so I just want to give a shout out to my church. We do have a golf tournament coming up. I got to give a little plug here. Um, give the plug. I got to give a plug. Um, and all the proceeds, really, Pastor Bob is just relentless. Like, he gets up every Sunday. And he's like, I said, will you stop saying that? He said, if I have to sell every single one of these golf spaces myself, if I have to go out in front of Harlow's, I said, why you got to go in front? It's a club. Why you got to go in front of Harlow's to sell the golf stuff? I don't get it. But he, 
he just has, he's always had a heart, you know, Pastor Bob was in, in our church and Letty and all of us that are here serving on staff. It's like, we don't just come in this church on Sundays and come to, to come to church, but we really want the community. We really want to make a difference in the lives of people. And so, um, I just want to say we, it continues on. So if you want more information about the golf tournament and in the book, it talks about how you can give to Eric's foundation and, Y'all, I'm just going to be continuing to be the Krista Armstead that I've always been, which is figuring out how we love people. Um, we make change. Okay, I, one last little thing. I have, this is hilarious to me, how God works. I have Sunday school students from Bethel that first, why, where are you going, Keisha? God just always sends me these little nuggets. So when I first got saved, I don't know a thing. They thought it was a good idea to put me over Sunday school. And I'm like, Lord have mercy. And that lasted all about two weeks and I got reassigned. But um, <laughs> I was reassigned to another position. It's okay. No, but just people like Bridget and Keisha actually were my Sunday school students. And they go to Midtown. Now, I didn't, I didn't invite them to Midtown. They just ended up here. And they're here. They've been here for a while. So I just see full circle how God has a plan for this community. My pastor, Stacy's father, was praying for this community back when it was bad and nobody wanted to be here. When prostitutes walked up and down Broadway and where, you know, crime was at an all-time high. And we were just this little church, these little people, brokered and broke, a bivocational pastor. And he said, we're going to go out and we're going to spread the love of Jesus in this community. So God has a sense of humor. 20 years later, he has me in the same zip code, the 95818, same zip code doing same thing, but in a broader way with a bigger, you know, bigger reach to the same community that he called me to pray for 20 something years ago. So may the legacy of go. God come on. May God's legacy. Yes. Continue. Yes. Well, we honor you. Thank you. Natalie. We are grateful for Thank you. you so much. Thank you Thank for you. your courage. As we know, courage sometimes can be the absence of fear, but it's also the absence of self. Yeah. So thank you for being thank you. selfless thank you. and and really being transparent and giving your all in this book because it's going to bless many. So thank, thank you, you so much. You guys give it up for Natalie. So thank so you. thankful.